You're listening to Real Atheology, a podcast that considers contemporary philosophy of religion from a naturalist or atheist perspective. two hours west of Toronto. And I, like I said in that little description, I had a dual focus on philosophy of science and history of philosophy. In my master's year there, I uh, had a professor uh, who was actually the editor of Hume Studies teach me David Hume, and it's been a love of mine ever since. Uh, I published a book on Hume, and I guess that's what we're here to talk about in 2019, but I've taught Hume uh, for the whole you know 20 some years in between getting my degree in now. Um, right now, I'm writing another book on uh, freedom of religion. So that's maybe something we can talk about in, a, in another few months. Awesome. Yes, we're very excited to have you on the show today to discuss David Hume's famous work of miracles. And so for those of you who may not be familiar, of miracles is an essay that appears in part 10 of David Hume's An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. And it's divided into two parts, and it basically gives Hume's um, what he calls an everlasting check, and it's an argument against the rationality of belief in miracles and founding religious belief on such religious miracle testimony. And so, Dr. Vanderberg, you've written a, a whole book on what is really an essay that only lasts maybe um, 13 or 15 pages or so. Um, but right. what do you see is um, really the importance of it in, in both the history of philosophy and why we should care about it today? So Hume's uh, little chapter, as you said, uh, of miracles has been controversial since it was first published, right? Almost from the moment that that book was published, people have been responding to Hume. And so by now, there's been thousands of different things that have been written about it. And so it's had a real huge impact on uh, philosophy. And of course, the rest of Hume's philosophy is also particularly important. Um, Hume is often thought to be the most important philosopher to have written originally in English, right? So not as important as Aristotle, but pretty darn important. Um, I think that Of Miracles is a nice little snapshot of Hume's entire approach to philosophy. And so that's one of the things that I appreciate about it. In earlier in the inquiry, I believe it's in section six, um, Hume draws a really important distinction um, between proofs and probabilities, and then also distinguishing that from demonstrations. And I've seen that this distinction can go often unappreciated, and it's it seems like it's a very important distinction. Um, but not all Hume scholars do agree on that. Um, where do you stand as far as how important is that distinction between? proofs, probabilities, and demonstrations. Well, you've picked up on something that I think is absolutely crucial to understanding what Hume's getting at here. I think the place to start is to remember that Hume divides all of our knowledge as coming from two possible sources. He calls them matters of fact. Those are things that today we might call empirical and relations of ideas. Those are things that today we would call logical truths. And so with regard to logical truths, we can have perfect certainty. And Hume's willing to say that relations of ideas you know, can be known to be perfectly true or can be known to be contradictions and therefore necessarily false. But with regard to matters of fact, Hume thinks that it's only possible to have knowledge to some degree of probability. I'm sure we'll get into talking a bit about Hume's view of probability later, but let's just take that sort of ordinary view that probability just means that your degree of confidence is somewhat less than perfect certainty, but of course it's higher than zero, right? Higher than nothing. So for Hume, all of our knowledge of matters of fact is going to be on this scale between uh, you know, maximum probability and, and no probability. However, Hume thinks that there are some things that even though they're matters of fact and therefore they're only probable, nevertheless, it would be unreasonable to doubt them. So things like the sun is going to rise tomorrow or uh, the law of gravity is going to remain as it is 
uh, until the end of the universe. Those kinds of things are matters of fact. They're not certain. But nevertheless, they're so probable, given the evidence that we have, that it would be unreasonable to doubt them. And those are the things that Hume calls proofs. So proof for Hume is a category of probability. It's the maximum category of probability. It's not uh, a reference to a demonstration. I think there's a problem for modern readers, and, and some of those commentators that you just mentioned is not understanding this distinction have missed this, I think, for this reason, that these days when we talk about proofs, we're often thinking about proofs in logic, demonstrations uh, in mathematics and things like that. So we say things like, well, we proved the Pythagorean theorem. What Hume wants us to do is to, to just use the language a little bit more carefully. He reserves the word proof for that maximum kind of probability. And he never uses it when he's talking about demonstration. So the outcome of a what we today would call logical or mathematical proof, Hume would call a logical or mathematical demonstration, and those out, those results are certain when those arguments work properly. I'll just add one other little note here, and that is that there's a concept that you might have heard of called moral certainty. And moral certainty comes from uh, sort of the uh, Middle Ages uh, in France. They, they came up with this concept because they were concerned with the question of how much evidence do you have to have for it to be not morally wrong to put somebody to death. So it's a level of probability, right? But nevertheless, it's enough to act in a practical sense. So what Hume calls a proof is quite parallel to what other philosophers sometimes call moral certainty. And the last thing I'll mention here is that this is a very ordinary kind of thing when you think about it, because in the law, we have this standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's exactly what Hume's getting at. And if we have a proof, that means that it's not reasonable to doubt the thing. Okay, so with that, those distinctions in hand, Hume then goes on in his essay um, to talk about first kind of characterizing the concept of a miracle, but then he also wants to draw our attention to the reliability of miracle testimony. So he, he sees this as a contest of weighing the prior probability of a miracle with the, the reliability of the testimony. Um, do you see that as Hume's primary aim in part one? And if so, why go on to write a part two? Hume has a part one and a part two, but if, if we can get all that argument in part one, why is there this part two? Yeah, some commentators really make a lot out of that. That never seemed to me to be a real problem. I think it's just Hume elaborating and providing more context and uh, giving another approach towards it. So I, I don't see a major issue with there being two parts here, but I think you're right that the basic idea is that Hume wants to show us that we never have enough evidence to believe that a miracle has occurred. And right? he wants to compare our evidence for the miracle uh, with sort of our ordinary expectation of how the universe operates. I guess it's important to start with the idea that Hume defines a miracle as a law, uh, as a violation of a law of nature. Now that's a lot stronger of a criteria than most people would give, especially today. I think if you ask a religious person or somebody in the Roman Catholic Church, for example, to define what a miracle is, they're not going to insist that it's uh, a violation of a law of nature. They might just say that it's something wonderful, right? Uh, but Hume wants to reserve the word miracle just for those things that are violations of laws of nature and other things that are merely wonderful, but consistent with the laws of nature, he calls those marvels. So this distinction between marvels and miracles is, is crucial to understanding Hume's purposes here. Now, as you know, Hume critiqued all different kinds of arguments for the existence of God and uh, things related to religion. Uh, unfortunately, that's kind of all spread out throughout his works. It appears partly in the inquiry that we're talking about today. It appears partly in the dialogues concerning natural religion. So it's hard to sort of fit it all together. But what Hume has in mind is sort of attacking each of the parts of the standard apologetic strategy. And he thinks that marvels can be handled under the heading of design arguments because they're consistent with the laws of nature. And so if they happen, they happened according to God's uh, you know, original plan for the universe. But miracles are a special kind of thing, right? It's an instance where a deity intervenes in the order of nature to produce some outcome that's supposed to signal that uh, the person who performed the miracle sort of has God's backing, right? And then whatever that person says about what God wants or what God's uh, 
religious requirements are for us, that sort of thing. That, that's supposed to be the, the sort of the guarantee that those are correct. So miracles understood as, as laws of nature are a special kind of evidence independent of design arguments. And so Hume wants to treat of them separately. Here is a place where um, an objection is often raised that Hume has somehow begged the question against miracles. He's defined them out of existence and they'll kind of compare it to some comments that Spinoza has made sort of along the lines of, well, look, um, you know, laws of nature are exceptionalist regularities, but a miracle would be a violation of an exception and you can't have a violation of exception. And so that this means that really in principle, miracles can't happen. But with all of what you've just said, it, it really seems like that objection doesn't have a whole lot of force. I don't I think you're think right. Yeah, I think that it's been a common objection, actually. A lot of people have misread Hume in this way, but I, th I think the clearest way to see that it's a mistake to think that Hume's ruling them out sort of a priori or in a circular way is to notice that for Hume, the claim whether a miracle has occurred or not is not a relation of ideas. So it's not something that could be perfectly certain. It's a claim about a matter of fact. And so it's going to be true to some degree of probability, right? Either high or low. And so if it's if it's possible, right? There's actually a principle I should mention here. I, I refer to it as the conceivability criterion. That's very popular in the, in the early modern period. Essentially says that if you can conceive of something without a logical contradiction, then it's possible. And for Hume, it's always going to be possible to conceive of a law of nature ceasing to be regular. Right. So for Hume, it's just not going to be a, 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 an a priori truth that the laws of nature are necessary and inviolable. For him, the laws of nature are empirical generalizations, which are only probable to some degree. And because of that, it's going to be perfectly possible for there to be an exception. Hume talks about this when he mentions the proposition that the sun will rise tomorrow. And he says that it's possible that it won't. Right. That something could happen. The laws of nature could change or the earth could stop spinning or, or any number of things could happen. He admits, admits that it's possible that uh, the sun won't rise tomorrow, even though it's a perfectly exceptionalist regularity of our past experience that every morning the sun rises. So I think once you understand that for human law of nature is not an ontological category, but an epistemic category, then it's you're quickly able to see that the objection that you just mentioned doesn't have any force because Hume doesn't say that it's metaphysically necessary. He just says that it's, as far as we know, there's this regularity in our past experience and we project it into the future. Right. So we have on the table then that miracles are not impossible, um, but they have a very low, what's called a, a low prior probability. Um, but even this claim gets pushed back. So someone like Tim McGrew would say, look, the laws of nature can't lower the prior probability of a miracle because the very concept of a miracle presupposes stable laws of nature. And that this is how, you know, the, con the stable law of nature is how God would communicate a sign. You know, the sign wouldn't be intelligible unless it had this stable nature to contrast with. Um, and so a lot of um, Christian apologists will try to make the claim that the prior probability isn't actually very low. It's, you know, that that's actually just presupposing a naturalistic or scientistic worldview. So we've dismissed, we've done away with one of the objections, I think that the first one we just dealt with was easier to deal with. This one, I think, is a little is is more serious. Well, I mentioned that there's been thousands of things written about human miracles, so I don't know them all. And it's been a while since I wrote this book, right? that was 2019. So I'm afraid I don't remember all the details of McGrew's argument. So maybe you could flesh it out a little bit for me. But my first impression is that, well, the first thing is that this concept of prior probability is part of uh, a Bayesian framework for thinking about probability, which is not at all Hume's way of thinking of probability. So now maybe that matters, maybe it doesn't in this particular instance, right? I, th I guess from what you said that McGrew is trying to get at the idea that um, in order for a violation of a law of nature to be possible, you have to have regular laws anyway. So that sounds right. I don't see that Hume would object to that, but uh, I guess I'm, I'm not seeing the, the whole force of 
of that argument. That's fair. Um, but so let's move to a, a different objector. So uh, one of the most common objections that you get to um, Hume's argument in Of Miracles really dates back to contemporaries of Hume in Price. And so the examples are that are usually given are lotteries. And so the idea is, so Hume wants to say that, look, ex- something along the mantra of extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You know, the more miraculous the claim that's being made, the more evidence we're going to need in favor of it. And Price is trying to offer a counterexample and saying that, look, something with a very, very low prior, prior probability, like a winning lottery ticket, is a very extraordinary event, but very ordinary testimony, you know, the local newspaper or just some local person on the street telling you the um, winner of a lottery establishes it really without any further thought. So it's very ordinary testimony can establish very extraordinary events. Do you see Price's counterexamples as um, offering a insurmountable objection to Hume's argument? No, I don't think it's insurmountable. I think that that kind of objection is actually perfectly consistent with what Hume's getting at, right? So let's say there's a one in a million chance of winning the lottery and the newspaper reports that somebody from San Diego named Bill Vanderberg won the lottery today, right? You'd be really surprised if you didn't know the results to, to know that I won. But once you heard the result, right, like you're saying, that's enough evidence to believe it. I think what you might say about it is that a one in a million chance is not a very low chance compared to the chance of a, of a, a violation of a law of nature. After all, we've got what, billions of people on the planet and all of us every day have experienced the fact that, um, I don't know, that uh, salt dissolves in water, right? Or that gravity is attractive rather than repulsive. So the if you want to just take a base rate, right? It's we've got, you know, not just billions, but gazillions of, of instances. So the chance of there being a violation of the law of water, a uh, law of nature, sorry, where somebody walked on water to take that example, right? It's never happened before. It seems to be inconsistent with gazillions of past instances. So it's uh, an extremely low probability compared to the the lottery one. I guess the other thing you could say about it is that reporting the results of lotteries is pretty common. And newspapers correctly reporting facts about things that happen in, in modern life, that's pretty common too. So we admit that those Newspapers are sometimes wrong, but they're pretty reliable most of the time. So we could trust that kind of report. What Hume would say, though, I think, is that the kinds of evidence, the reports that we get about the occurrence of miracles are very different than those that we find in newspapers. So, for example, if you look at the New Testament's uh, you know, reports of the miracles performed by Jesus, well, the New Testament was written a long time after the events supposedly took place, right? As we know, the Gospels weren't written by anybody who was there at the time. And so we've got this problem that, well, okay, first of all, were these events properly perceived? We have to remember that at this time, right, they didn't have science. They didn't have very much knowledge of the natural world at all. So maybe many things that today we could explain using science, they might have thought as being extraordinary, so extraordinary that they would would have described them as violations of the laws of nature. Then there's the ordinary problem that, you know, perception is fallible. And especially when we're in a heightened state, like when something religious is happening, our emotions are triggered and we are often aren't very good perceivers under those kinds of conditions. And then add to that the you've heard of the telephone game, right? This campfire game where somebody whispers in somebody's ear, goes around the circle and comes back. And by the time that the sentence gets back, the sentence is totally changed. So that's a problem of transmission. And if you don't have eyewitnesses, well, then you've got to deal with a chain of transmission. Add to that, you know, the translations and copying and editing that happened to the New Testament to get it to us. And, you know, there's at least a worry that you have to introduce there that the transmission wasn't clean. And finally, we know that there are many cases where people uh, have reported miracles where once we've investigated, it's turned out to be a, a case of deliberate deception. So what you might say about it is that, look, if you look at the evidence for a miracle from the New Testament, for example, there's going to be problems about misperception 
mistransmission and deception, all of which are going to cast some doubt on whether the report was correct. And then you weigh that against the evidence for the laws of nature, which are supposed to be violated in that report. And the evidence for the laws of nature is perfectly uniform. It's gazillions of examples against one you know, really weak uh, report that you, that you just don't, don't seem to be able to trust very well. So I think that, that there's actually a significant difference between the kind of lottery example that Price mentions and the kinds of cases that Hume's really interested in. Interesting. So the out, out of the common objections that I hear to Hume, um, probably um, the most common are price and lotteries and then something along the lines of miracles don't really have a low prior probability. But the third objection I hear most often, and I don't really know how to formulate it, is it's just an appeal to John Ehrman's Hume's abject failure. I'm never really told which argument <laughs> of John Ehrman's is supposed to kind of refute Hume's of miracles. But how important do you see um, this? Because I, I know that when, it, when you look in the Hume literature, some Hume stuff, they just ignore it entirely. So not everyone responds to it, and it's not entirely clear what the significance is other of it other than uh, – John Ehrman's uh, rhetoric, really. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, so Ehrman's book was actually the inspiration for me writing my book. I, I read his book and I got so angry, I immediately wrote a paper about it and presented a, a conference paper at the American Philosophical Association. I think that was in 2003, uh, maybe 2005. Uh, and then I wrote it up and published it in Hume Studies. And when I was responding to the editors, I realized that I had enough material to turn it into a book. So I worked on it for a while and then got distracted by academic administration that I was in for, for a while and came back to it a few years later. But anyway, um, yeah, my reaction to Hume, sort of the anger that I felt at the, how he how badly he had mistreated and misunderstood Hume was widespread in the Hume scholars uh, community. Um, Hume is a really well-regarded philosopher of science, um, one of the best in the world. And he wrote a book uh, called Bayes or Bust in 1992. So he's quite attached to the idea of Bayesian epistemology. And he just took those tools and applied them to Hume, but he didn't really read Hume very carefully. And so he made a lot of mistakes in his interpretation of Hume that led him to make these really outlandish, exaggerated claims, like that Hume's argument is an abject failure. And, um, you know, so some Hume scholars have engaged with him and have shown why he's wrong. I did that in my book and Robert Fogelin did something similar. There's been a few others as well. A lot of the uh, book reviews of Ehrman's book did the same thing. There's one from Michael Levine that was especially strong, I thought. Um, so some scholars have engaged with Ehrman and others have just said, look, he's such a bad reader of Hume, misreader of Hume, let's forget about it and just go on and do real Hume scholarship. Um, but I think that where Ehrman mainly goes wrong, I think this is really what you want to be to mention here, is that he misunderstands Hume's claim. He thinks that Hume is making a metaphysical claim that miracles are impossible. And that would mean that the occurrence of a miracle has a probability of zero. But just from what I've told you already, you should be able to realize that that's not possible given Hume's epistemology. Hume thinks that the question of whether a miracle has occurred or not is a matter of fact, and matters of fact can't be certain, either certainly true or certainly false. So Hume isn't going to assign the probability zero to any uh, claim about a miracle. That's the first thing. And that's related to the point about proofs and probabilities, right? Um, the other thing I think is that um, Ehrman makes kind of uncharitable claims about Hume, about probability. And this is partly because he's reading Hume through the lens of mathematical probability theory and Bayesian epistemology. And so he does things like accusing Hume of using the straight rule of induction, which if you've ever heard of it, it just says that if you have a uniform set of experiences, you just infer that with perfect certainty into the future. And, you know, we know from statistics that variation is going to happen. And just because you had a certain sequence in the past, that's not going to be the exact same in the future. So Ehrman's right that the straight rule is a bad rule of induction, but he's wrong that Hume is using it. I guess the last thing I would mention about where I think Ehrman goes wrong is that 
like all Bayesians, he says that the threshold for rational belief is a probability of 50%. But for somebody like Hume, 50% probability would mean that it's about equally likely that the thing is true and that it's not. And Hume, in the tradition of skepticism, would say that, well, when you're in that situation, you should suspend judgment, which is to say, decide not to decide, right? withhold your opinion, because the evidence doesn't lead you in one direction or the other. So some people have argued there's mathematical ways that you can get around that, but I don't think it's worth bothering with that because in the end, what I discovered writing this book is that Hume's theory of probability actually is totally incompatible with the mathematical theory of probability. This is the part of your book that I found the most interesting because I'll confess when I started my, uh, so for those who my, my background is in science, specifically engineering and so when I came to Hume, I came with the probability calculus kind of already in hand. So it was just a tool I just picked up and started using with Hume. But you have a different view. You think that, no, we shouldn't be so quick to apply these modern tools to interpret Hume. We should instead use the tools that Hume was working from, which include Roman law. And I found that absolutely fascinating. I, I wanted to hear um, more of your thought, uh, explain to the audience kind of where, how your thinking came about in this direction. Yeah, thanks for uh, remarking on that. I think it's one of the um, original contributions of my book, if you want to put it that way, that really nobody has, has noticed till now that Hume's uh, use of evidential probability falls into this tradition. And that's partly because as you've experienced in your own education in science and engineering that we've sort of just become embedded in the mathematical theory of probability today, right? That's how we talk about probability. Even I end up talking about that, uh, talking about probability that way, even when I'm trying not to sometimes, it's just become so much part of our culture. Um, but Hume uh, kind of got unlucky because the mathematical theory of probability started to be developed right around the time that Hume was writing. And he was vaguely aware of some of it. And then uh, after the first edition of the Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding was published, uh, Bayes wrote this paper, he died, and his friend Price showed it to Hume. And Hume, because he wasn't a great mathematician, you know, didn't really know what to make of it. But then sort of there was a fork, right? And Hume's way of thinking about evidential probability kind of fell into the background, uh, became kind of invisible compared to the mathematical theory, which lots and lots of people were very excited about. As well, they should be, right? It's a really powerful theory. You can do all kinds of great things uh, in all kinds of contexts. But I think where we've made a mistake, us moderns, right, is that we've taken the mathematical theory of probability to be the only correct theory of probability. And so we have people like Millikan and McGrew and Ehrman trying to apply the tools of mathematical probability theory to Hume. And it's really interesting when you like survey all the different Bayesian critiques of Hume, about half of them are pro-Hume and half of them are con, right? <laughs> Which is to say that it's not obvious what the correct Bayesian interpretation of Hume is. And my diagnosis of that, this is really the, the, the factor that led me to this diagnosis, was that uh, that's because Hume's account of probability isn't compatible with the mathematical approach. Uh, a philosopher named Dorothy Coleman published a paper on this in Hume Studies. I forget the year. I think it was in the 80s or 90s. And that was also something that I came across that uh, sort of sparked me, went down this road. She argued that Hume's account of probability, because it's got this three-part structure of probabilities, proofs, and demonstrations, is incommensurable, as you said, with the mathematical theory of probability. And so that got me thinking about it more. And I started to trace down or chase down uh, Hume sources. And what I found out was that there's a theory of evidential probability that goes back to ancient Roman law. And the way they talk about evidential probability is exactly the way that Hume uses it. And so there's a book by uh, James Franklin published in 2001 called The Science of Conjecture, which talks about the early, here, early history of thinking about probability. And that's really sort of one of the places that I got uh, this idea from. So that combination of uh, Coleman and Franklin, and thinking about the fact that the Bayesians can't seem to agree uh, about what the correct interpretation of Hume is, that sort of led me down this path. Now, I wouldn't argue that 
you know, that Hume's account of probability is the correct one or the only correct one, right? What I would say first is that, look, as historians of philosophy, we should pay attention to how people thought about these things in their own time, right? So the principle of charity of interpretation requires us to not say things like what Ehrman said, right? Not to claim that Hume was silly because he didn't have the Bayesian theory of probability. He couldn't have, right? Bayes developed it after the inquiry was written. So uh, the principle of charity of interpretation tells us to interpret these authors on their own terms. And so understanding that this old tradition of probability exists is really important for us, I think, for history and philosophy. That allows us sort of to recover a way of thinking about probability that was the dominant one at the time that Hume was writing. I was really interested to learn when I was looking at these details that even people like Pascal and the others who helped to develop the mathematical theory of probability, they're almost all trained as lawyers. So they too knew this ancient tradition and they were trying to do something new with the tools of mathematics. It ended up branching off and becoming its own thing. And we just sort of kind of forgot about the, the ancient tradition. So remembering that ancient tradition is really important. I guess the other thing I would say about it is that it's possible, actually, that that tradition of thinking about probability that is incompatible with applying numbers might actually be the right one in some circumstances. I don't try to prove that case in my book, but I do try to you know, suggestively propose it, and maybe others will pursue it. Uh, but I think it's uh, at least a plausible account of thinking about evidence. I think that's absolutely fascinating. So... This uh, this has been such a great discussion. So to kind of wrap things up, um, what do you think the enduring lesson of Hume's of miracles is, and how do you see it affecting philosophy in the future? Well, I think by now Hume's argument against miracles has become one of these perennial topics in philosophy, and people aren't going to stop talking about it just because it's. So engaging, right? It's a, an interesting topic to begin with. It's important for theists. It's therefore important for atheists. And so, so it's like everybody's interested in this kind of stuff. So I think people will continue to, to write on it. But I hope that when they do, they remember that, you know, proofs are not the same as demonstrations. And that Hume is really making an epistemic point, not a metaphysical or ontological point. He's not saying that miracles don't exist or can't exist. He's saying that we just don't have enough evidence to believe, to have a reasonable belief a reasonable belief that a miracle has occurred because every report of a miracle that we've ever had has been subject to problems about misperception, mistransmission, or deception. And when you balance all of our background knowledge against these very weak reports, then it's never going to be reasonable to believe that a miracle has occurred. Now, you might stop there, um, but actually Hume thinks it's a, there's an important next step, right? Because in addition to showing whether or not the miracle happened, you have to figure out, well, what caused it? Was it a divine being? And from the fact that somebody walked on water, for example, you can't tell whether a divine being caused that, right? So that's another kind of problem in the inferential chain for people who are trying to use miracles to support theistic ideas. Even if you could show that the miracle was caused by a divine being, how could you figure out which doctrines, like, like which, which divine being it was, right? And which doctrines you're supposed to think of as supported from this. So for Hume, ultimately, the point is that we can't prove anything about religious hypotheses from reports about miracles. And that's really all he wants to say about it. Figure out, well, what caused it? Was it a divine being? And from the fact that somebody walked on water, for example, you can't tell whether a divine being caused that, right? So that's another kind of problem in the inferential chain for people who are trying to use miracles to support theistic ideas. Even if you could show that the miracle was caused by a divine being, how could you figure out which doctrines, like, like which, which divine being it was, right? And which doctrines you're supposed to think of as supported from this? So for Hume, ultimately, the point is that we can't prove anything about religious hypotheses from reports about miracles. And that's really all he wants to say about it.
Music is by the Chicago-based band Casserole. If you appreciate the content and the tone of what Real Atheology has to offer, please consider writing a review on iTunes or sharing an episode on social media. We also have a Patreon, to which you can make a small recurring donation in support of the show. Special thanks to our newest patron, Tyler Bimrose, as well as Jason, Robin Willems, Ed Atkinson, Kashi Samara Rira, Kim Bushkovsky, Anthony Lawson, Jeff Rubinoff, and Brandon McCleary. Music